Hello, my name is Eric Salib. I'm one of the sports medicine physicians here, and today we'll be doing physical exam of the shoulder. I have a general routine I like to go through, and I do this every single time when I examine a patient's shoulder, starting with inspection, moving on to palpation, range of motion, then we test strength, and then we go through all the special tests of the shoulder. So first, let's look at inspection. Looking at this patient, we'll both look at him from the anterior view, then we'll move to the lateral view and move on to the posterior view. Generally, we'd like to look at symmetry, right to left. So you should always have the patient remove their shirt um, and so you can expose and look at all the structures of the shoulder. First, you'll look at the pectoralis muscle. Make sure that looks symmetric right and left. You'll look for any deformities along the clavicle. You'll see if there's any bruising, any redness or swelling. And then you'll look at the overall musculature of the deltoid and, and biceps and see if there's symmetry there. We'll then move around from the side of the shoulder and come towards the back. And we'll look to see if there is any signs of atrophy along the rhomboids, the latissimus, and then the rotator cuff muscles, which are along the scapula. We'll also look to see if there's any difference between the right and left upper trapezius muscles. After inspection, we'll move forward onto palpation. I like to start from the center here along the sternoclavicular joint. I'll follow the clavicle all the way down until its attachment point onto the sternum, and I'll palpate there, see if there's any tenderness. I'll also, while I'm palpating for tenderness, Check to see if there's any asymmetry between the right and left side. Is one side more prominent or is one side more deep? Then we'll move and walk along the clavicle and see if there's any tenderness along that area or if we feel any deformities or step off along the way. As we come to the end of the clavicle, we'll reach the acromioclavicular joint or AC joint. Again, we'll see if there's any tenderness or if there's any step off, jump or step there. Then we'll move around along the acromion, which is the lateral side of the scapula, as it wraps around the back and forms the scapular spine. We'll palpate along the scapular spine and see if there's any tenderness there. While we're in the back of the shoulder, we'll also just palpate the musculature of the upper trapezius, the lats, the rhomboids, and the bony structure of the scapula. After palpation, We'll move around to range of motion. In testing range of motion, we want to test the shoulder as it moves in many different directions. And again, always compare the good side or the injured side to the unaffected side. So what I first like to start with is forward flexion. So I'll have the patient extend both his arms out, and I'll have him actively raise his arms up as far as he can overhead. In this position, I'll then have him move down into active arc of abduction adduction. I'll have him lower his arms down by the side and see if there's any change in the movement of the shoulder while he does this. Does he lurch the shoulder forward when he does it or does he raise the shoulder up and then lift the arm up? If any of these occur that can be a sign of pain or dysfunction or weakness in the shoulder itself. Then we'll move to external rotation and I'll have him bring both his elbows by his side while keeping the elbows flexed at 90 degrees. Then I'll have him, keeping his elbows by his side, turn his arms out in external rotation, and I'll measure the amount of external rotation he does, again, looking at both sides. Give me relax. Lastly, we'll check for internal rotation. There are many different ways to do that. However, I like to check how far the patient can reach up the back. And if you just focus the camera on me, I'll have the patient reach back, and I'll measure how high he can go up on the spine. So go ahead and do that for me. And then when I document, I'll document how far he can reach that. You can relax your arm back down. So if you remember your landmarks, you have the sacrum. Where the iliac crest comes, the top of it, will then be L4. So if we just see in this patient, he was able to reach to about right here. So here is the iliac crest. If we follow this along here, that would be about L4. If you also remember your landmarks, the inferior aspect of the scapula is T7, so this would be a thoracic 7. If you follow the spine along, 
that will usually be T3. So if you lose those landmarks, you can guesstimate where the patient is reaching, T3, T7, L4. After we test range of motion, we'll want to test his strength. First, since we have him in front, we'll test his arm strength here. So first we'll test abduction. So I'll have him go ahead and push his arm against me here. And this tests the deltoid muscle. And you can... Then I'll have him push his elbow backwards toward me, testing the lats. Then I'll have him test with the elbow here adduction or internal rotation, which will test the pectoralis muscle. Then we'll just turn his hand up in this position and we'll have him flex the elbow against resistance and that will test the flexors of the, of the elbow, particularly the biceps and brachialis. Now we'll move on to the rotator cuff. And the way, again, I like to test this again is by testing right to left. So if you could bring your elbows by your side again. And I'm going to hold the elbow in about 90 degrees. I'll have the patient externally rotate against me by keeping his elbow by his side. And I'll test his strength. This tests both the infraspinatus as well as teres minor of the rotator cuff. Then I'll have the patient bring his arm up into full flexion at 90 degrees. 45 degrees abduction, and I'll just have him turn his hand down and apply an upward force against me. This will test the supraspinatus muscle. Then he can bring his arm back down. And there's two ways you can test subscapularis. The traditional approach is to have the patient place his hand behind the back. And if I could have you come around. The traditional approach is to have the patient try and push his hand off the back. Now before you do that, many times the patient will cheat. They'll keep their wrists up against the back and just press this way. Make sure the patient does not cheat in this fashion. So go ahead and try and push the whole hand off the back. Good. And you'll test the strength that way. Alternatively, you can have the patient play their, place their hand on their stomach and pull towards her stomach as I try and pull it away. This also tests subscap and sometimes can be utilized in a patient that has too much pain to reach behind the back and give you a proper strength test. So, so far we've gone through inspection, palpation, range of motion, and strength. Now we're going to go ahead and do the special test of the shoulder. And these can be quite complex and seem cumbersome and quite worrisome. That's why we're going to go through each one slowly. So as you saw, we tested the rotator cuff strength by testing open can, which was supraspinatus, external rotation, which was infraspinatus and teres minor, and we also tested subscap, that got the rotator cuff. Now we want to see if the rotator cuff is getting irritated. So there's two tests that you would do. One is Nears, and the other one is Hawkins test. First we'll do Nears. So Nears, you'll have the palm facing down towards the ground, you have the patient relax. I will place my hand over the spine of the scapula to stabilize the shoulder so that the patient does not cheat when he does this exam. I'll take my hand and make sure the elbow is in full flexion and I'll raise the arm up and I'll look for any elicited pain or discomfort as I forward flex the shoulder. Then if we lower it down and keep the shoulder at 90 degrees flexion I will then 90 degree flex the elbow and I will internally rotate the shoulder and elicit to see if this has any pain. This is called the Hawkins test. If any one of those are caused discomfort or pain, that would be considered a positive test. Then we will move on to the biceps test and there are two of those. One is called Speed's test and the other one is called Jurgensen's. Speed's test, you'll have the palm facing up. You'll flex the shoulder up to about 60 degrees. You'll flex the elbow about 30 degrees. And you'll have the patient apply a force up against you. This test for the biceps, usually more in the proximal portion, okay? Then Jurgensen's test, while the elbow's at 90 degrees, you will have the patient resist supination. So the motion you want the patient to do is supinating while flexing the elbow, and you will try to resist that. So go ahead and do that, and then see if that causes any pain at all. Now, 
If you have any concern of where the biceps is actually located, I usually like to come underneath the patient's arm, hold the wrist, place my hand just anterior lateral on the shoulder, and I will supinate and pronate the shoulder to see if I can feel the biceps tendon rolling over my finger. So it's a simple test to see if you're looking for the biceps tendon, if it's in its correct location. So if the patient has any pain or discomfort, you would want to move over and check that on the patient. Next, we're going to move onward to instability tests. These are probably the most of the complex ones to do and the hardest to do because they're just difficult. But first, we're going to start with the sulcus sign. This is probably the easiest one to do. If anybody has had a dislocation of the shoulder, if they have instability of the shoulder, it feels like it's slipping out or subluxing, these are some of the tests you'll check for that. So by sulcus sign, you'll take the hand, as the patient has his arm by his side, and you'll just kind of pinch the antecubital fossa and apply a downward force with traction on the shoulder while stabilizing the shoulder. And you'll look to see if a sulcus develops along the lateral ridge of the shoulder here, just underneath the acromion. If there is a positive sulcus sign, you will see a drop as you apply that force down. Additionally, you can check in a modified fashion if there's any translation anterior or posterior to the shoulder. You can again stabilize the shoulder, get underneath the uh, wrapper arm around the humerus, and with this arm you can apply an anterior translational force or a posterior translational force. Again, this will test for anterior instability. This will test for posterior instability. However, the textbook way to test for posterior instability is called the jerk test. You'll take the arm up in a 90 degrees flexion, again, 90 degrees flexion of the elbow, and you'll apply a compressive force this direction along the shoulder as you bring it into abduction. If there is posterior instability, the shoulder will clunk or slip as you do this maneuver. For an anterior test, you will do what we call the anterior apprehension test. Again, bring the arm up to 90 degrees, forward flexion, elbow 90 degrees, and then you'll externally rotate into the high five position. Okay. As you hold the patient here, you will apply an anterior force on the shoulder in this position to see if the shoulder feels unstable. The patient will call wince or try and pull away or cause pain. So you'll do that by applying an anterior force. So we've tested both inferior instability posterior instability, and anterior instability of the shoulder. One more test you can do while the patient has instability is what we call the relocation test. You'll have the patient lay supine. You'll kind of just have the arm kind of hidden, kind of tuck into your axilla while you Grab the humerus and you apply a downward and upward force to see how much translation the shoulder has. If the patient is a baseball player, many times we'll test internal rotation in this particular motion, uh, sorry, position. So we'll bring the arm up in 90 degrees abduction, elbow in 90 degrees flexion. While stabilizing the humerus, I will internally rotate and see how much internal rotation he has. If there's a significance between the throwing arm and the non-throwing arm, then we worry about a capsular tightness region. Okay. Bring your arm up. So now we've gone through the rotator cuff, the biceps, and instability. Lastly, we're going to look at a structure called the labrum or the cartilage of the shoulder. There's no great test to test this, but for the textbook, there's a test called O'Brien's test. You'll again bring the arm up into 90 degrees flexion, about 10 to 15 degrees of adduction, and you'll turn the thumb down and you'll have the patient apply force upwards against your resistance. If this causes pain, this usually is indicative of an anterior labral issue. One thing we mentioned was the AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint. If there is a step off, you kind of know that's what your diagnosis is, but sometimes you just have pain in the area. The way to test for an AC joint pain and discomfort is to do the cross, the 
adduction test, we'll call it. <laughs> so we'll have, so we'll, have, we'll do the adduction test. So again, you bring the arm up into 90 degrees forward flexion, and you'll forcefully apply across the body here. And that will cause pain along the AC joint. Lastly, many times patients will be complaining of shoulder issues, but they may have a radiculopathy coming from the neck, particularly at the level of C5, C6, which comes down and gets the top of the shoulder, the deltoid, and part of the biceps. So I like to check their neck also. Just very briefly, I'll have them forward flex the neck, so bring the chin down to the chest, good, and chin all the way up to the ceiling. Then I'll have him turn his chin to the left, Turn his chin to the right. And then back in the neutral position, I'll have him have, try to take his ear and press it to the shoulder here. And the opposite side. And then lastly, I'll do a test called Sperling's test. The way that you do that is you will extend the neck while rotating. And you'll apply an axial load. So you'll be pressing down on the neck. And you'll see if that causes any pain that she's down to the shoulder or upper arm. Then you'll do the same thing by extending them and turn them the opposite direction. What we're trying to do is try to compress the nerve at the level of C5 or C6 or in the neck itself and see if that causes reproducible pain in the shoulder. This concludes our shoulder exam. If you have any questions, please uh, do not hesitate to contact me.